Uh, hopefully this is good because Andrew McCarthy told me just a moment ago he does like a good sermon. So <laughs> I'm hoping this works out for him. Um, but uh, well, welcome. Uh, glad we were getting here uh, safe, as Jesse said. Uh, let's, can we turn this down just like a, a smidge, that light? Um, it's a little apropos, though, this storm, right? It's uh, preparing. We're, we're going to look at Psalm 55 today, uh, which uh, you see David. It's a psalm of lament. Uh, it's very much him in the middle of a storm, not a physical storm, but certainly an emotional and a spiritual storm that he is caught in. Uh, and we will look at some of the background there and some of the things we see. But uh, first we're going to pray, uh, then we'll read through this psalm, and then we'll get into uh, uh, dig in here. So let's pray. God, thank you uh, for bringing us here. Thank you for your word, for preserving it, for uh, inspiring it, that we might uh, learn from it, that we might be encouraged in it, that we might... Um, again, just write it upon our hearts that we might, uh, that we will not sin against you, Lord. And as we study this time that uh, David writes about, uh, where he is betrayed by a close friend and there is trouble all around, uh, he finds his hope in you. Uh, and we pray that we would take that away in his example. Uh, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's go ahead and read through this. This is Psalm 55. Um, if uh, you don't uh, have your Bible, or you happen to forget it, or you don't have one, the Bible pews, I think it's page 445. Um, I'm Psalm 55. Uh, Cast your burdens on the Lord. Some other uh, translations I saw said, you know, uh, um, trusting in the Lord when betrayed by a friend, what have you. But uh, starts, to the choir master with stringed instruments, the masculine of David. Verse 1, give ear to my prayer, O God, and hide not yourself from my plea for mercy. Attend to me and answer me. I am restless in my complaint, and I moan because of the noise of the enemy, because of the oppression of the wicked, for they drop trouble upon me, and in anger they bear grudge against me. My heart is in anguish within me. The tears of death have fallen upon me. Fear and trembling come upon me, and horror overwhelms me. And I say, oh, that I had wings like a dove, I would fly away and be at rest. Yes, I would wander far away. I would lodge in the wilderness. I would hurry to find a shelter from the raging wind and tempest. Destroy, O Lord, divide their tongues, for I see violence and strife in the city. Day and night they go around it on its walls, and iniquity and trouble are within it. Ruin is in its midst, oppression and fraud do not depart from its marketplace. For it is not an enemy who taunts me, then I could bear it. It is not an adversary who deals insolently with me, then I could hide from him. But it is you, a man, my equal, my companion, my familiar friend. We used to take sweet counsel together within God's house. We walked in the throng. Let death still over them. Let them go down to Sheol alive. For evil is in their dwelling place and in their heart. But I call to God and the Lord will save me. Evening and morning and at noon, I utter my complaint and moan, and he hears my voice. He redeems my soul in safety. From the battle that I wage, for many are arrayed against me. God will give ear and humble them, he who was thrown from of old, because they do not change and do not fear God. My companion stretched out his hand against his friends. He violated his covenant. His speech was smooth as butter, yet war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet they were drawn swords. Cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. But you, O God, will cast them down into the pit of destruction. Men of blood and treachery shall not live out half their days. But I will trust in you. Amen. So that is the psalm that David writes here. Um, and I will try to battle that age-old battle that people have probably looked at. There is, a, anyway, there's probably enough to talk about here for, for days. Uh, I will try to condense it um, and, and pull off some of these, these key points that I want to look at here. Um, but clearly it is a psalm of lament, right? It's, uh, there's certainly some uh, 
promises of God in there and some, some things, but it's, you know, uh, I would say it lands squarely in that Psalm of Lament. It's written by David, clearly. Uh, it says so right there in, uh, in the title. Uh, but he's tackling an age-old problem, right? A betrayal of a close friend. It's not new. It's not brand new in the 21st century with, with social media. This has been happening um, forever. Uh, you know, when you think about these psalms, it was a, a, a poem or a song. Um, and so David is this inspired artist by this, call it a cruel muse, right? Somebody who has inspired him uh, through hurt, this close friend. Uh, we're going to look at some background there a little later on and kind of see some context of what's happening here. But, uh, you know, this has been inspiring people forever, right? You, you look at, uh, you know, there's a, a song on the radio now called Real Friends where uh, the artist is singing about, you know, I wish, uh, I, wish I had real friends. Every time I uh, get, let somebody in, I find out what they're about. They, they, they turn their back on me. They, they, they let me down. Uh, Julius Caesar, right, the famous line, et tu, Brute, right? Uh, literally backstabbed, right? Brutus uh, stabs him, a close friend, and he joins a conspiracy, um, one of the slimiest villains in literature. Um, in the Count of Monte Cristo, Fernand Mondego portrays his friend, Dante, um, close friend over, over a girl, uh, turns him in, he goes to Shadow Deef in the prison. Uh, and then the other famous line, right? Godfather II, what is it, right? Gives him the kiss of death. I know it was you, Fredo. You broke my heart. You broke my heart, right? And then he goes and he deals with it himself. He doesn't turn that over to the Lord. He uh, has him executed, mafia style. Um, I said to say, like, this isn't a unique situation to David, and it's not a unique situation to any of us that have gone through it. That doesn't make it feel any better. Um, but certainly, there is comfort in knowing that other people have come through this. And here we see David betrayed by a very close friend. Um, and we'll talk about who that was uh, and the circumstances that surrounded that. Um, and God puts it like this in Jeremiah. Uh, he says in Jeremiah 9, 4, Let everyone beware of his neighbor and put no trust in any brother, for every brother is a deceiver, and every neighbor goes about as a slanderer. Like, I mean, there's, there's plenty of other patches, passages that talk about the condition of man. We're hopeless, that the, the, the heart is evil and wicked and... and Man doesn't have the capacity to, to, to rule themselves. There's these other passages, but um, Jeremiah sums it up pretty, pretty nicely, right? People are going to let us down, uh, and that does not, you know, just because somebody is close to us does not uh, make it not like they're not going to. So I'm going to look at um, uh, some of these things, right? No one is immune, right? Think about King David. He's a king. He's a warrior, man of strength. This isn't, you know, uh, you know, anyway, somebody is just getting taken advantage of or is kind of a doormat his whole life, right? This is um, a man that's anointed. So let's catch up on some of David's highlights up to this point, right? He's, he's a humble shepherd who's anointed by uh, the prophet. It's Jesse's son. They call the brothers, right? We know the story. Uh, he's made Saul's armor bearer. He's defeated Goliath at this point, clearly. He's king at this point. He's led military campaigns, not like just little skirmishes or a battle of four or five. It's like big campaigns, thousands of men. Right? What's the line? He's killed a lot of people, whether by his own hand or in these campaigns. Right? They sing that song, Saul's killed his thousands and David's killed his tens of thousands. Right? Um, he's ran and hid from the king before he's anointed publicly. He survived in the wilderness on his own. Um, he returned the ark to Jerusalem, Philistines. Um, and now we find him here as he's writing this. He's in his 50s, um, probably early to mid 50s. Uh, he's had a number of children, three of which are really important in this, in this setting. Uh, he's had a son named Amnon. And so for some homework, you can jot down 2 Samuel 3. Uh, Chapters 13 through 14, maybe 15, 16, depending on how far you want to read, um, is where this, all this context is coming from. We said three children, one named Amnon, uh, and 
he is half-brother to Absalom and Tamar. Tamar is Absalom's full sister. Well, Amnon has an uh, ungodly uh, desire for his half-sister, Tamar. Um, through some events, he takes advantage of her forcefully uh, and then puts her out. He's disgusted with her himself, puts her out in disgrace. Get out, I can't believe that. Leave. Well, Absalom sees her, uh, his sister. He knows what happened. She lives with him, and Absalom kind of talks about how he just kind of ignores it, doesn't say anything, but he's a plotter, so his head's spinning, right? He later kills Amnon, his half-brother, and he's banished. He runs, he's banished. He can't go back to Jerusalem. He can't go in the king's presence. He starts to plead and appeal, the, the, let me come back, let me come back, let me come back. So finally, David says, all right, fine, you can come back, but you can't come in my presence. You can come back to the city, sort of house arrest. And then he appeals and appeals and appeals, and he's finally like, fine, you can come into my presence. And at that point, he starts this conspiracy where he's standing outside the city gates. He's trying to get all the people against David uh, for a few years. Right, oh, man, if, if I was king or if I was this, if I was that. He's very handsome. He's very charismatic. That's where this conspiracy starts. It is in that moment and in those, those circumstances that David pens this psalm and is inspired to write this psalm of lament. Um, so let's take a look at a few things we see in this psalm. <clears throat> we see um, the condition of David's heart. And we'll step through each of these. Uh, we see the effect on the city that it has. We see the betrayal of a friend. We see David's hope, who he hopes in. And we see a future picture of Jesus in David in this moment. That's what we'll step through uh, tonight. So, let's start with David's heart. And this is really in verses 2 through 8. You see some, uh, some language that's way beyond just your, your run-of-the-mill, somebody did me wrong. Right? Like, oh, I had somebody and... They started a rumor or something, right? Like, it goes way beyond this. Look, look, look at some of the language that David uses. I am restless. I moan. My heart's in anguish. Tears of death have fallen upon me. Fear and trembling come upon me. Horror overwhelms me. He wants to flee. He wants to run. Right? It's like, if I had wings like a dove, I would fly away. This is a king who's talking about, I would, if I could, I would leave my kingdom. This isn't like somebody who lives in the suburbs of Jerusalem. This is the king himself going, I am so distraught. I wish I could run away. I wish I could get away. I wish I'd just go live in the wilderness. It's worked for me in the past. Right, this, is, this is where David's at. Um, you know, he talks about, uh, he uses this, this picture of a dove. You know, doves aren't fighting birds. You ever heard of dove fights? Right? They're defenseless. Um, they're innocent. They're usually a picture of innocence. And he's trying to say, look, I've, I haven't done anything wrong here. And these folks are, are, are pouring um, torment on me and oppression. Talks about it's dropping from above. Right? Uh, these people are, uh, as a military person, right? they, they're on the higher ground pouring this stuff on me. Like they're at a tactical advantage. I can't get out from under it. They're just pouring it down on me in this horror. Horrors overwhelm me. Um, that, like, when you read those passages and you read this psalm, it is taking a heavy toll on David. He's been through a lot at this point in his life. He's got a son who's killed one of his other sons and he's let back into the kingdom and now he started this conspiracy and he's turning people against him, one of which is a friend that we'll see later. Um, I mean, most of us can relate to, in some regard, respect to David, whether it's a family member or a close friend um, that's hurt us. I don't know if anyone's conspired to overthrow anybody's kingdom here, but that uh, we, we certainly had, can go on that. So we see David's heart, right? This restless anguish to the point that he wants to flee. Um, there's also a toll on the city that happens. Um, if you look at verses 9 through 11, you can see this picture, uh, right, that there's violence and strife, oppression, runes in the, uh, on the streets. 
uh, in its midst. It paints a very disturbing situation in the capital city, David's kind of center of power, right? This is where he's undermining and uh, starting this conspiracy. Uh, they talk about it's everywhere. It's around the walls. The words they use, they, they circle the walls. It's sort of like um, they're prowling. They're, they're circling. They, it's everywhere. It's around the city, but it also says it's in the wide spaces, marketplaces, streets, different translations. But it's, it's around it. It's inside of it. And it talks about day and night. Right? It's all the places, all the time. Um, there's strife. There's ruin. Um, and he says, divide their tongues, right, in, in uh, verse 9. Destroy, O Lord, divide their tongues. He's asking God to, like, do the same thing you did at the Tower of Babel, right? He's like, hey, confuse their language because they aren't doing, this is not a military coup. They didn't gather up a bunch of armies and, and lay siege to the city. They're talking and recruiting and undermining and spreading rumors, and if only I was king, and this, that, and the other about David, and I'm so great, right? And he's saying, to, to divide their tongues, make it ineffective, um, destroy their speech. Why? He knows God's done it in the past. He's, he's asking God to do something he knows has happened in the past, right? Uh, that he is capable of. He's relying on what he knows of God. He says, um, and the trouble is because of talk and speech. If you look here, there's all these allusions to words, right? Divide their tongues. Um, later on in verse 20 and 22, um, his speech was smooth as butter. His words were softer than oil. Um, and we'll talk about uh, a little bit of those things. Um, but we see David's heart and the turmoil he's in. It's affecting the place he lives. Um, and now we see this last piece here, or we see his friend, this betrayal of a friend. Uh, it doesn't have the same ring as Etu Brute. I have the, the same meter. Etu Ahithophel. This is, this is the guy that he's writing about when we look at verses uh, 13 and 14. <clears throat> so if you look in, that, in those passages in 2 Samuel, <clears throat> In 2 Samuel 15, 12, it says, And Absalom sent for Ahithophel, the Gilonite, David's counselor from his city, even from Gilo, while he offered sacrifices, and the conspiracy was strong, for the people increased continually with Absalom. He's recruiting, right? He recruits his counselor. 2 Samuel 16, 23, this, is, this speaks to how good of a counselor he was and why it was so important that Absalom kind of recruits him into the, the conspiracy. In 2 Samuel 16, 23, it says, And the counsel of Ahithophel, which he counseled in those days, was as if a man had inquired at the oracle of God, so was all the counsel of Ahithophel, both with David and with Absalom. This is a smart guy. This is somebody David turns to when he needs help, when he doesn't know what to do. Uh, Absalom knows that. He gets him. Um, and in 1 Chronicles 27, 33, it's listing off, uh, you know, a bunch of different um, positions and people that held them in, in David's kingdom. And it says, And Ahithophel was the king's counselor, and Hushai, the archite, was the king's companion. Hushai becomes very important when you read that story. I won't spoiler alert it for you, but um, remember the name when you read. So David says, I could handle it if it was an enemy. My brother? Look at the terms he uses. A peer? A man like me, my equal, depending on the different translations you read? My companion, my familiar friend? We used to take sweet counsel together. Other, other translations will use uh, fellowship. We used to have this sweet fellowship together. Walk around in the throngs of the temple or the church, whatever the tent says. Uh, the place of God, the temple wasn't built yet, obviously. Um, he says, if it was an enemy, I could do it, but it's a, what I thought was a friend. He gets very personal here in that verse 13, but it is you. Like he, Almost like he's standing right there in front of him. It's you. Right? He later loses his life. He uh, takes his own life. 
So I would suspect that this was written prior to that. Or I would I feel like it would be mentioned, but um, he says, this is my companion. Right? Not only does he gain a foe, he loses a friend, an ally. He's like, if it was anybody else, I would have went to you and said, hey, what should I do here? He's like, I can't. You've betrayed me. Um, you look down and you see some of what he, uh, he is like. You see in verse 20 through 22, he stretched out his hand against his friends. He violated his covenant, not a covenant with the Lord. Sort of like he was a friend. There's unwritten rules that friends go by. When you're the king's counselor, you don't just go join the other guy's team. But he did. He was two-faced. He says, his speech was as smooth as butter. So the guy was greasy. Yet war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil. That word soft there sometimes is uh, translated soothing, right? Oil was medicinal. He's like, it was soothing his oil. The guy's just greasing and buttering me up all the time. And yet down in his heart were war and swords and strife. And this guy was in my face talking all this stuff. And they went around and come to find out it's a traitor. He says too in verse uh, 15 after he says, we used to take sweet counsel. He says, let death still over them. Let them go down to Sheol alive for evil is in their dwelling and in their heart. Right? It's not just in, internal. It's everywhere they go. It's in their home. These people are filthy. You can tell he's hurt. But this idea of um, let them go down to Sheol, right? Like when they say Sheol, sometimes it's translated pit. It's like deep in the earth, this idea of Sheol. Um, again, David is praying for something that God has already done. Um, if you want to jot a note down, in Numbers 16, you can take a look there. There is another revolt against Moses. This guy, Korah, K-O-R-A-H, uh, revolts against Moses and Aaron. It's like 250 men, and they come up, and they're like, oh, you're, you didn't take us into the land of milk and honey, got us in the desert still, you're terrible, we should be, you know, men of God too, we're holy, all this, that, and the other. Uh, Moses falls on his face, him and Aaron cry out to the Lord, and lo and behold, when they, he's like, look, the next day the God's going to show you who's his and who's holy, and who's not. And so he gives a speech and he says, you know what, look, if, if God just lets them die naturally or whatever, I'm wrong. But if he does something else altogether, you'll know I'm right. And then he says, hey, all you guys, uh, give a warning to all of Israel to stay away from those guys' tents and stay away from those people. And as soon as uh, Moses gives a speech, the, uh, the ground opens up and swallows them up into Sheol. David's making reference to this last revolt that took place with Moses. Because again, he's calling out to God like, hey, do what you did before, Lord. Divide their tongues like you did at Babel. Or swallow these guys up, Sheol, like you did in the desert with Moses. These other traitors and rebellion, rebellious folks. Um, so again, twice he references these things that God's done in the past. Um, but most importantly, though, we see where his hope is, right? We, we see the condition of his heart, his anguish, the terror. He wants to flee. Uh, it's busting his city up. His city's a mess. His own closest friend, the one he most likely would turn to, has betrayed him. So where does he go? Very first line of this psalm, give ear to my prayer, O God, and hide not yourself from my plea for mercy. He talks about attending to him. Um, there's the other verse that talks about in morning, noon, and night. That doesn't mean just during the day, right? That's a picture of all the time I'm crying out to the Lord, right? Kind of runs parallel to the all the time my city's a, a big mess. But he says, morning, noon, and night, I cry out to the Lord, um, He's leaning on the history of God, what he knows about the Lord, what he's seen him do in the past in his word, right? That he, he has swallowed people up in his shield. He has confused people's speech. Um, 
And he knows God is faithful, unlike the description we see in Jeremiah that has come to play out in his friend's life, in his own life. Um, not to mention, obviously, his own son is leading the revolt. And yet, um, you know, there's other psalms that uh, people think are alluding to that, but this one in particular is about his friend. But Deuteronomy 7, 9 says, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his command to a thousand generations. That's very different than what you see in Jeremiah 9 that says, look, everyone's a slanderer, everyone is wicked, everyone's a betrayer, right? But God is faithful and keeps his steadfast love. And so what does he do? In verse 22, you see this great <clears throat> instruction and promise. He says, cast your burdens on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. That, that word move there <clears throat> is sometimes uh, translated like shaken or overthrown, right? It's that idea of not just moved physically, right? It's more talking about you won't be shaken or overthrown or put off the spot that you're, you're supposed to be. And in David's case, I'm supposed to be on the throne. There's been a promise that I, my house will remain on the throne. He's like, and he will not be moved. It's interesting when we look at this, as we see a lot of this in the life of Jesus. Right? It's this deja vu moment when you're looking at Jesus in the garden at the end of his ministry. He's in a similar emotional state in Matthew 26, verse 37 to 38. <clears throat> he's going in the garden. This is the second time he goes out and has to wake the guys up again. But he says, and he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. That sounds an awful lot like David's psalm. I'm grieved, distressed. Um, he's betrayed by someone close, right? Matthew 26, 48 to 50. Now the betrayer, Judas, had given them a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man, sees him. And he came to Jesus at once and said, greetings, Rabbi. What a slimy guy. And he kissed him. Jesus said to him, friend, do what you came to do. Then they came up and laid his hands on Jesus and seized him. But we also see Jesus' hope is in the same place. His hope's in the Father. Again, for the, and this is in a, Matthew 26, again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, my father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. He trusts in God the Father. He understands that the Father will make things right, that he will be vindicated in the end. Um, he, he must bear the cross so that in his vindication, we can have ultimate vindication in the end. Um, but his trust is in the Lord, even though it will be hurtful and painful shameful and he will be mocked and beaten um, he says your will be done let's take a look at just two quick things as we close um, hope for what what we have in ourselves right what we see is a picture of what we get in the flesh with David right anguish anxiety restlessness overwhelmed um, right, these emotions, they're real, right? They can, uh, these things can be devastating. I don't know if any of you have had anxiety attacks or panic attacks or just that, that feeling of overwhelmedness where it's almost immobilizing, right? Where um, I'm tired but I can't sleep, right? Like, Head on the pillow, eyes like just pop open. No peace, no rest. Um, when we face circumstances like this, right, we have to look up and not in because there's no peace in ourselves, right? The, the heart and the flesh don't breed peace. They don't, you can't, it, it it doesn't work. There's no self-help, positive thought, good vibe, uh, 
do-it-yourself permanent solution in the flesh for peace. It doesn't exist. However, in God, when we look up, we have all the things we're looking for in the flesh. Right? We see him in the psalm. We see him in, in the garden. Um, in verse 18 in, psalm, in the psalm 55, it says, He redeems my soul in safety. That word safety there is shalom. Peace. Most often translated as peace. He redeems me in peace. He gives me peace. He gives me rest. I don't know about you, but when I feel anxiety, like the one thing I miss is rest. Like I can't, and, and to be fair, I'm, I'm wired not to have a lot of anxiety, fortunately for me. Uh, not everybody's like that. Um, I, I feel, you know, I thought that I don't stress out or have other things that, that get to me or whatever. Um, but when I do feel anxious, the one thing I miss the most is just being able to relax and rest. Um, but we get that. He says, look, he redeems me in peace when we turn to him. Right? We see that rest. Um, that's what he's looking for when he says, I wish I had wings like a dove. I would just fly away and rest. I would be at peace. I would relax. I would rest in him. Um, and we see victory, right? We will not be moved. Right? That's, that's not like a cast your, cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will, ne- he will never permit the righteous to be moved. Sometimes, maybe, right? Like, it just flat says, he will never permit the righteous to be moved. The righteous cannot be overthrown because Jesus can't be overthrown and it's his righteousness that we wear. It's not our self-righteousness. The self-righteousness can be moved. The self-righteous can be moved and overthrown, but the righteousness of Christ cannot be overthrown. It cannot be moved. We have victory in him and that's what we get uh, when we look up. And the two examples that you have here are what closed the Psalm 55 I will trust in you, David's words, inspired by the Spirit. I will trust in you and Jesus in the garden. Your will be done, right? When we feel like we are anxious, when we have been hurt by someone close, and someone not close, uh, but in this particular example, you know, uh, I will trust in you, your will be done. Turn it over to the Lord like David does um, and get rest. So the rest of this story, uh, Absalom starts his conspiracy. He gets his buddy, uh, Ahilophith, and he's asking him, he's like, uh, you know, and David hears about it, and he's, he's very distraught. So Hushai, who's David's companion, David sends in a double agent, he says, hey, I know we're going to go high, we're going to go do these things, but you, Hushai, why don't you go to Absalom and confuse the counsel of my counselor and see what that does? So he sends him into Absalom. Meanwhile, he's petting this thing, probably right, like you dirty rat, I can't believe you, right? Well, when his counselor proposes his plan to Absalom, sure enough, Hushai says, hey, um, you know what, usually his counsel's pretty good, but I don't think it's good this time. Why don't you do this instead? Instead of going into the, the concubines and sending all these men, why don't you just try this instead? And then he goes and he gives time to warn David, and David gets out, and then it lets him kind of gather his troops or what have you. Well, when his counselor, Ahilopheth, finds out that his counsel wasn't followed, he knows something's up. He knows David got away, and he's about to get it. So he takes his own life. Then the, the battle happens, the skirmish happens, right? And Absalom, right, you know the rest, right? Gets hung up in the tree and his troops, even though David said, hey, let him live. It's like, nope. Yeah, no. Sorry, David. This guy's got to go. Sticks him. Goes back and David's very distraught to the point where one of his guys says, hey, David, by the way, you need to buckle it up and go tell these guys that you're glad that they did everything they did and quit grieving about this traitor. So... He's vindicated. He stays on the throne. He is not moved. Um, 
It doesn't mean he's not hurt. He loses a friend and a son. Um, but he still has his hope in, in the Lord. So um, let's pray. Are, they, are you guys going to do another song? I'm sorry. Where's Jesse? Was there another song or no? Okay, all right. You guys can come on up while we pray. Sorry. God, thank you so much for um, inspiring David to write this. Um, while it was circumstances that were painful um, for him to bear. Um, in fact, we see Jesus go through uh, a similar experience at the end of his life where he is betrayed to his death on the cross for us. Um, but Lord, both David and Jesus, their, their trust and hope was in you. I would pray, Lord, of as we face similar circumstances or these times of anxiety or storms, uh, that we put our trust in you, God. That we put uh, our faith in you. And that we cry out, uh, your will be done, Lord. To your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.